thinking, upsetting mode of thinking that before the only way that, you know, psychologically, they always have to make up big terms that nobody understands. <laughs> out of control thinking, they call it ruminating. Yeah. Ruminations. And what research shows is, is that when you're stressed, and I could just simply call it stress cycle, because you are, are stress cycling. You're cycling your stress by how you're thinking, which is aggravating your already you stress sensitive brain. And then as you get more upset, your thinking shuts down. Network where recovery has a voice. even more, you can't acknowledge that you're crazy because no. you have to prove you're not crazy. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's Monday night, and you know what time that is. It's time for Marty McGibbon's kick-ass personal transformation. You see that the ring really is lost, so you're driven. You know, I lose my house keys. I lose my glasses. And there's nobody else around. And now I give you your host, Marty McGibbon. Hi, everybody. I am so stoked about our guest tonight. Tonight we have with Nobody me. else has been around. You know, at that point, I either have to keep looking and prove it. Dr. Terry Gorski, and he is an absolutely amazing person in the field of relapse prevention and in recovery in general. He has written many books. He's a prolific author, has written lost many, many books um, about recovery that are just absolutely wonderful educational books. Um, one of my favorites is Learning to Live Again, A Guide for Recovery from Chemical Dependency that uh, he wrote. Um, there's another one called... Oh, I have to acknowledge I'm crazy. Or else I have to just <laughs> acknowledge that we'll organize the repeat mistakes. <laughs> and I'm into a failure. And, uh, understanding the 12 steps that I absolutely love. And uh, he has a number of them, Passages Through Recovery. I mean, there are just yeah, but so many of them that, that they are absolutely wonderful. He has had an illustrious career as a thinker. He's been all, my glasses all over the world. Those are not to prove that they're lost. <laughs> speaking about addiction, and uh, as an addiction treatment professional, I have tremendous respect for him. I actually had the privilege of and studying he, with knowing the, um, I, the Terry Zagorski for my uh, advanced certified relapse prevention uh, certification. And um, he breaks the mindset that's blocking them out. He, this guy is so cool. And I'm just, uh, you know, I I could say so many things about him because he has a really, well, anyway, his bio is up. The, on, on, on my website, so <laughs> you can go there and see that. But one of the things that's so cool, he's like the James Bond of recovery. Uh, the keys or the glasses or the whatever are found. They are your- He has an uh, award called the uh, the Holy Imp- the Falcon that he received. It's an international humanitarian award, and he received it for his work in Iceland. It's essentially, the country of Iceland called him and said, Terry, help us with our addiction. And Shane, Terry went over there and did that. And you, eight inches from someplace, I looked 10 or 12 times. <laughs> they gave him this award. And there's a bunch of other stuff that he's done that's so cool, but I'm not going to take any more time. I just just want to introduce. <laughs> yes, that's true. Uh, Dr. Terry Gorsi, or Terry, Terry to us tonight. Um, hi, Terry. I'm so glad to have you here. Well, I'm I'm really pleased to be here. Hey, you're know, talking about here. You're fantastic. doing a wonderful thing getting the word out with your show. Thank you very much. Well, you know, that's the thing. It's, uh, we want to share about everything, interrupting the mindset that, that we can with our recovering community. And my audience and our audience on the Pure Motive Network, we're people in recovery, both short-term and long Do you think that uh, term recovery, and we're just interested in celebrating recovery and uh, and learning all we can to make sure that, we, I mean, we have strong recovery and we actually create a lifestyle that's uh, in, in uh, 
fun and enjoyable. And I know you are all about doing that too. Those of us that are in, we all right. Oh, I'm recovery, right? And we're coming back. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm all about I didn't, helping I didn't people hear to create again. a new. Oh, you, what I, I was saying from right on board with us helping to uh, help helping people damage that we've sustained from our drinking or we educate people about addiction, about the disease, and about recovery so that we can build a drugging or hunger recovery and um, develop a, a um And we have, I mean, I'm in the long term and a lifestyle that's fun in recovery. Well, that, that, you know, that's exactly how we've got it. Right. 15 years because you know uh, in, in recovery and uh, recovery uh, begins with good information. Now um, somewhere but I, saw, I have still I know I believe it's in some of the it's in the big book or if I if I engage in um, 12 and 12, but it says information alone is not enough. Negative things. People misinterpret that and say you don't need any information. And it, you know, if, if I engage in, in <laughs> but it's information that lets you understand and in rumination figure out what you need to do, and then you need the like <laughs> that I create. <clears throat> it comes back pretty quickly, doesn't? It? Learn how to manage what's going on inside of you. Which is the obstacle to putting I mean, a recovery program into action? The, the cycle, the stress cycle, and 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 all the other stuff. I mean, it, it comes back pretty. So well. the understanding is important, but it's got to go way beyond that. You have to use quickly the and information that's, that's, that you've come to understand. Yes, to, to, I I had a mindset when I was in my active addiction. I because of a lot of terrible take it. Take it um, to put it into use every day too. I mean, things happen to me. And repeat, you know, like each day practice the recovery program, and and uh, and I kept trying to use to take away the pain, and of course that creates the next day daily renewal. Do it again. More, am I right? <laughs> yeah, you pain, but you practice, and but you also have to be forgiving because. I had this idea that uh, that things were bad and that I was no... You know, there's no such thing as a perfect human being. Good. And um, if you... And that bad things... Try to do it perfectly... ...were going to happen. Well, in recovery, I've changed my attitude, but... You try to do it in somebody else's way, that is the best way you're <laughs> so going to look they, at yourself down and fall down. You have, you know, good things to happen. happen. Pretty much, I expect good things to happen. I have had a lot of good things, things happen. The world is to learn how to stand up because, as fallible human beings, we should get in the beginning of constantly falling down. Beautiful. I know that uh, I see with me, I, Marty. I break you of um, I didn't, I didn't I break you with that, and I just keep you. Your books, the many books that I've read by you that I love, I pessimistic all the you, time. So. You have something where you say uh, recovery is like walking <laughs> up and down. And, <laughs> well, because that way I can keep you in therapy forever. And you know? make a lot of money. Yeah, but you know, later, and I love that. You know, Can and you tell me some more about that? So what yeah, well, I was going to say, uh, that's an idea that it's a uh, but to me, while but it was doing a lot, I entertain negative thoughts. It's amazing how quickly lecture, when I had just begun talking about the old attitude comes back. Relapse prevention. And I... Oh, man. I, I wasn't even... Ver- very well known. I was doing community seminars at the treatment program in a hospital I was working at in Chicago, and I happened to remember that when I was uh, when I was in the world, I got I got to do this. They're all against me, you know. That, it'll come back, and I and I can observe it, you know, and I can hear. Yeah. I was in a in a shopping mall. There was an escalator, and wrecked. 
and get back on mm-hmm. to a more uh, normal. You but can, it, um, you know, um, there was an up escalator and a down escalator, and I decided to try to. But it, it, it comes quickly, please. So it's kind of like a thing we have to just keep doing. And go up the down escalator. And no matter how fast I would go. Every day. and uh, It's because you've got your relative to the steps. I stayed in the same place. And in order, the brain's got two strikes against it already <laughs> without considering the brain dysfunction. To get to the top. I had to go twice as fast as I would have to go if I weren't on the escalator. Now, let me let me explain this. Most, not all, but most people who become addicted. Now, unfortunately, our brain, the damage done by the addiction from dysfunctional, abusive, or emotionally, or emotionally neglectful childhoods. Right. Addiction and probably the genetic and, you know, prenatal and all of So as a result, they don't get fully enculturated, which is why they see the world so differently. These other influences that go in to predispose us to be um, alcoholic or addicted, and they um, develop ways to cope with the pain. Um, all of these things set us out on life walking up or down escalator. So if they do work and keep their sanity for that moment when they're kids, but they, they beings like just to keep up with other people, we have to walk faster and work harder. Come embedded in your first personality template, which is the most powerful and never fully goes away, just to come off the scratch. And the only way to turn the doggone escalator off. So all Uh of these organ problems and the beliefs and all of this stuff, you can also use our addictive substances. And then for a few minutes, the stairs stop moving, and we can work around them when you're in a low-stress state. Yes. But when you're in a high-stress state, relax and feel and actually behave pretty much like normal people. From this, you go back, these are called survival responses, and they really oh, yeah. did save your life when you were younger. Yeah. Now, it doesn't and last very long. Recovery, when we start applying all the all the healing and everything that we're doing in recovering our brain, I had adult, adult trauma. I had adult trauma, and I had PTSD, and I think sometimes... That comes back. Uh, now, if that's healed, then it's a maintenance program, right? I mean, I'm, I'm still walking up the down escalator, but I'm doing things that like a thing as the early childhood stuff, or is it a different set well, the of... the thing uh, is, when you, when you have childhood trauma, which almost mm-hmm. everybody... Does. After now, it's, it's like a workout, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, you know it's, it's, like, it's like anything. If you were on a job, right? And yeah. then when you experience adult trauma, which almost everybody does at some point, yeah. um, you know, I when I used to work out quite extensively, um, I was amazed. You haven't developed the tools to manage this. What the current trauma does is it hooks you back it's a very vivid, in order to keep growing and developing, getting faster and getting stronger, I constantly had to work harder. And every time I had a crisis of the unresolved childhood trauma, and those two get all mixed up and double charge, you're already stressed up, the, the intensity of my average workout. Within a while, my body adjusted, and that, like, became the normal, and I was considered a long brain. Uh-huh. And then if you don't know what's going on, you have no way to begin untangling this mess under sweating to it, you know. I was no longer having yeah. to work hard. So in order to get fitter and fitter and fitter, you have to constantly keep working at your cutting. Because in the moment you're identifying with your thoughts, you're not sitting there observing yourself. You're sitting there into the moment. Edge. And right. there's a, there's also work rest cycles. You can't be working at it all the time. You have to have some time to take your mind off. 
So, and you can't stop yourself. You don't know how to stop yourself. You've never learned how to do it. Now, yeah, what you okay. said is very intimate, um, but I believe the truth is that when you become addicted and get into state recovery, for you said that you hit a point where you got so frustrated with it, you started to laugh. Yeah. There's a certain ever reason. Um, you have to be healthier, Harry. And it's by a man, it's by a science fiction writer named Heinlein who wrote this phenomenal book a million years ago called Stranger in a Strange Land. And it's about oh, a better able to manage your feelings and emotions than other people because the hard work we do in the who Yeah, a guy was raised on a Martian, but he was human, and he comes back to Earth, and he's a Martian by culture. And the one thing he can't do that people do is laugh. And it doesn't give us an award or doesn't make us a stellar performer. It just brings us back to where people who aren't addicted normally are. He goes to the (laughs) zoo, and he sees the big monkey... um, uh, he sees this, the, they've never, yeah. you know, because, but because they've never felt the crisis and they've never done the work of getting to know themselves and they've never checked on the work, the biggest monkey in the pecking order, get a peanut and the big one takes it away from him and he goes to hit him and the big monkey smacks him and figuring out what goes to hit the big monkey back and realize what's going on around. It's going to be toast. So he told them, when you get in sobriety, your worldview is very different from all goes down to the next one of the pecking order and smacks them, who goes to the next one and smacks them until finally the small people who have smallest, weakest monkey in the cage get smacked. Those who never had a personal recovery program or have never oh, had yeah. therapy or have never done significant personal growth. And right. all of a sudden hit somebody, there's nobody to hit, so he curls up in a ball on the bottom of the cage. And at this point, Michael Valentine, you're saying, wait a minute, it's meant the Martian starts to laugh. <laughs> I don't fit in the world, and I really don't want to fit in the world. And, and the people with him were trying to teach him about laughter, says, why are you laughing? And his response is very instructive. I, you know, the drinking and the drugging, laughing because it hurts so much, is a lot about normalizing the brain so we can pretend for a little while we really belong. And there's nothing else I can do with it. Oh, boy. That, that's a really good illustration. <laughs> Humor is not about good. It really fit in. Well, that's true. All right. Humor no. is taking us time. Humor is... Uh, projecting my pain onto a victim and twisting it around and making them yeah. the scapegoat so I can laugh at them. So I actually had a question. Um, you know, my experience has been that I have relapsed quite a bit, and I will get it. Oh, well, is- or laugh at myself. I mean, I I don't, but I'm, I'm a comedian, so I, I, I've, uh, <clears throat> and what I do in stand-up comedy is more self-deprecating humor. So I think to a program, I will do good maybe for a year or two. Have that's more mine. But yeah, I, I know I know what you're talking about. And people, well, people yeah, remember and, and, the two extremes. And I have no idea, or no, no, it doesn't even cross my mind that I even want to go. It comes to your from eyes angst. Back you. Yeah, it mm-hmm. comes from angst. You know, laughter does. Yeah, because I mean, when you're, when you're right. back to it again, but for whatever reason, everybody else seems to. Comedy be. material, you want to write about what you're neurotic about or what you're. <laughs> you want anger is a real good way to. You know the reason why I did it. I don't know all the time. I can give you little examples. Produce comedy material. You know. <laughs> so you need to raise awareness of something causing horrible pain. It, but. You know, I throw away everything that was given to me, and I go back, even when I... That's part of the human condition. And then when it starts to get almost unbearable, you provide the comic relief, 
I know that my life has been so good. Okay, you know, and there are there are slipping the scripts and making it funny. Yeah, I think we all do that day to day. Points and what you're saying that are really, really important. You know, the I mean, I think we do that day to day. If we want to be emotionally resilient, we have to be able to not take ourselves too seriously. And we don't. If you had heart disease and you had a second heart attack, would you say you threw away? Well, no, that works in recovery. Anytime I start thinking that I've got to hey. think, I've got to take myself seriously. I'm in trouble. If you threw it all away, okay. or would you simply say I got a disease and I had a heart attack? I'm really, I'm no fun when I'm when I'm doing that. When I'm taking myself seriously. I take life seriously. I take my recovery seriously. Right. If you had cancer and you did everything you were told and you fell out of remission and the tumors came back, would you take it myself seriously <laughs> for disaster? What about you, Steve? What do you think? Well, sir, I think it's a fascinating conversation. And I threw away my cancer recovery, you no. know? But in this, we don't, we say that. And I know we've talked about this before, the different roles in a family. And my, I identified with that because. Disease, but we don't act like it's a disease. And the belief systems are real. My defense mechanism has been humor. If whenever there was a problem, my father was an alcoholic. But whenever there was a problem, just make people think as a moralistic problem. I threw it away. I sinned. People laugh, and then everything will be okay. And I use humor to this day, and I think I use it as a defense mechanism. I broke the rule. I did something wrong, and there's no forgiveness, you know, and humor is a universal defense mechanism against the reality that life hurts. That's just not true, and we're, none of us are getting out of it alive. You know, we're, we're, the, the, those of us in recovery, we're working with a fault. <laughs> You know, <laughs> honest right. Hemingway, all yeah, true stories out of it from brain chemistry. Yeah, there's no other way to say it. And the and also, if you look at the research, you know, yeah. we don't get out of it alive, and we yeah. don't get. You know, think about this. People laugh when I talk about, you know, most relationships. But think about the absolutely most of the alcoholics and addicts I've met. They're not average in intelligence. They're not average ending of a long-term, committed, married couple. What's the absolute best ending that can come to an old conceptual of the long run of eight of their life? They can both yes. they die. Yes. They are way above average. And they can see the world from such a different point of view in their sleep on the same night. Yeah. 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 And how often does that happen? Virtually never. It's the t- and they sense physically insignificant the things that are wrong in the world to the point where it hurts so bad that if they don't have and it's normally one of those fools dies and abandons the other one and the one who dies first gets the better of the deal. Brain chemistry where they can medicate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> They fall into depression and manic depression yeah. and attention deficit. <laughs> <laughs> How most of us get these dysfunctional people? You see, but you yeah. notice how it's got twisted it in disorder. And all of these, because most people yeah. say, "Oh, it's the parapolitical." Um, geez, I call these the pathologies of the genius. You know, yeah. every he died. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you did hear about the the 82 year old man who went to his doctor to get a family thinker suffered from these things. Ernest Hemingway said all true stories end in death, and then well because he was getting married, and the doctor the doctor says to him he says he says oh that's good you're fine you find a woman to share your final years with. 
you have a picture and he pulls out a picture and it's a uh, two year old play maybe a decade after he wrote those world words, he died with a shotgun in his mouth, pulling the trigger yep. himself. Wow. And play like bunny. You know, one of these sex bomb type women. And the doctor yeah. looks at him, looks at the picture and says, This is gonna be your wife? He says, Oh yes. And he says, Stanley, I've been your doctor for over thirty years, I gotta tell you, this is not at all unusual. The suicide rate among addicts is 10 times higher. The heart can only stand so much. The veins can only stand so much. The arteries can only stand so much. Stroke can reduce, and I'm telling you higher than that. I recommend against this because your wedding night could end it for the rest of the population. And it doesn't go down that much when people get sober. It's not because they're that drunk in the moment. And Stanley says they're shocked. He thinks about it. He says, well, you know, doctor, I've lived a long life. I've loved and I've lost. I've been married four times. I've succeeded. We have a brain that can conspire against us if we don't work with it and train it and fail. And I guess I just have to take it with a grain of salt. If she dies, she dies. <laughs> 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 I didn't get smart. Nourish it, and um, if we don't learn to relax and we don't learn to consciously overcome, uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, the real. Okay, but if you can't okay. the twist, this twist is humor is a form of catharsis, and catharsis has been such a sensitive trigger that can be set off in our brains. Yeah, Terry, let me, I, I can't, it's okay. I just wanted to say that, that I'm dominated. Catharsis is simply the ability to have an emotional release. It means being able for a moment to interrupt this ruminating. I'm so glad you mentioned that because learning to, to nurture the brain and uh, in recovery and, and work with our brains that's something that I've experienced. Uh, Self-abusing or other abusing, this highly stressful automatic thinking process. One of the things we have to learn how to stop. I know when I, well, for instance, one of your books, Straight Talk About Addiction. Uh, I know you've mentioned this in a lot of your books, but this one I, I really love. Because if we don't and the stress gets high enough, we won't be able to stop it unless circumstances or people outside of us intervene. What you had in Straight Talk uh, 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 about addiction, um, about the relaxation and um, stress management skills. In yeah. And then if we can't turn it off, we start to hold, hurt so much we can't stand it. But we can't laugh anymore. And how it's mm -hmm. the way we manage stress, how how we're able to manage our stress and manage our um, our feelings, uh, that's really crucial. And there's only one thing that always works. The yeah. addictive brain goes on and says, you know, this is my ultimate survival mechanism. No, no. not. I'll just get the relief and then I'll stop. To to creating a solid recovery, and uh, some of the relaxation skills and stress management skills that I learned when I or I know this is the beginning of the end, but what the hell? If this is sobriety, who wants it? Mm -hmm. Right. I studied with you for my relapse prevention certification. I use those uh, every day, and you know when I first uh, became aware of of and yeah, when so there's always, a, there's always a relapse justification <clears throat> right? that people have. And that is the last, I think, the last vestige in recovery that people have to come to terms with. Your stress management scale that you had, I think it was the 20, um, there was a thermometer. <laughs> mm -hmm. I looking at that, I thought, wow, I if you can go up and down that thermometer all the time. Really get people to really think deeply. What would have to happen to you? What would you have to lose 
that would hurt you. <laughs> you know, I had to I had to look at that, and then and how you were saying, you know, when the stress level rises, your 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 brain. I mean, you, you're not fine. fat enough that it would justify drinking. And there's usually yeah. something for people in early recovery. For yeah. people who have really got the truth, you know, my day in the sun with my addiction is over. My brain mm-hmm. is adapted and it's not anymore. You're not, you know, and, and, and it, it happens. Uh, so when you learn the stress management skills, then you can get some level of um, uh, serenity. It won't ever work again. Right. You know, I found yeah. myself wishing I could drink and make it go away, but I know it won't be. You know, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I'm just and laughing Marty, about it because I still get stressed out, and I've been practicing this stuff for about five years. <laughs> but but the beautiful thing is, work. no, I, I know, know that, that too. And, yeah. so, if somebody so, came into my house and put a gun to my head and said, "I have the stress management tools now," um, I, to help with that, and uh, boy, I mean, um, the other day I lost. Said, uh, uh, drink or I'll shoot. I just say go ahead and kill me because I'm not. I'm not doing it. And it'd be the same thing. They might as well just put a bullet through my head. Something in the house. I lost my wedding ring, and my stress levels went way up. And I've, I've never lost this wedding ring before. And I started. <laughs> I just so because because I'm I, a little I can't. And I say I would say give me the bottle. I pretend to drink and then smash them in the head with it. I looked everywhere, everywhere, and finally, by the end of the day, it turned up in a, in a pants pocket. <laughs> you know, like it was in the pocket of my jeans. And, <laughs> you know, well, that's a better because strategy. if I go down, I'm taking a piece of somebody with me. That's just me, however. <laughs> Um, All right, I'm on. I probably found it by accident. I did. I found it by accident. I was getting ready to go out. Uh, okay, the there, there are two change. things. You know, the mystery. <laughs> my, I modified my plan, and I'm going to go with your role model. I'll, I'll do the I same thing. I'll ask for the bottle, and I'll whack it. Because I asked, I asked of your ring was a trigger uh-huh. event. Exactly. And the trigger exactly. event activated self-punishing oh. automatic thinking. What's the wrong with the end? I posted it on my Facebook page, your quote. I do mindfulness to manage the stress from fighting back against the many forces. How stupid could you be? And you also realize I'm never going to find this. What the hell? And I'm supposed to be sober, and I'm still running video talk show host, and I'm this, and I'm control me. And I gave you credit. Oh, a thank great you. Quote. Yeah, I you know, used a little bit of any, profanity, and you... you know, what's the matter with you? All right, now that's the first thing. So you're beating yourself up, which is driving your stress higher and higher. You washed it for me. That that was really good. Thank you for that. Yeah. Even if I, said, yeah. I went I'm through all phase, this. five stages of grief. <laughs> I don't ever flip any blanks and swear, you know. Um, I did say I went through the five stages of grief yeah. over it. <laughs> okay, but now the second thing to understand oh, I, again, is, but you know, these, we are creatures yeah. of habit. We are yes. totally in, you know, uh, there's, there was there was one person who used to tell me when my saved by our habits, and the only way to get any little bit of freedom is to choose carefully the habits we allow to control. I have not to save us. Right. But any time I can wane, anybody loses that, or I can wane philosophical. And what he meant by okay. anything. What they do is they have that, is he can begin reflecting of the places they look where they think it might be. This philosophy of life. <laughs> and then they look, and they don't and find and it, begin realizing that which convinces them that it's lost. There's nothing awful <laughs> because it can't be it worth it. can't be lost. So they go and they look in the same place. And the race is really all over it. Is. it is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> now they really yeah. know what it is, boss. 
So they go and they look in the same places all over again. And unless they have enough humility, like I do with my eyeglasses, I have very bad eyes, and I take off my glass, yeah. you know? And, so yeah. You, and you, you if it is what it is, it's not worse than it is. And it could always be worse. I listened to Albert Ellis. It was a privilege to have heard him lecture on this. And I can't find them because I can't see. And I have a back <laughs> pair of glasses, which I also can a number of occasions. And one time in a question and answer, he says, you have to always be capable of reminding yourself that things. And then I, then I, have, to, I, have, to, I have to call my son and say, TJ, can you help it always get worse than they are? And one person raised his head, so I disagree with you, Dr. Ellis. Find my glasses. I feel like a blithering idiot, you know. <laughs> yeah. Then, if you're being burned to death, how can it possibly get worse? And what I'm doing is we're confirming the belief that it's lost. Yeah. <laughs> but even pausing, Ellis said, you could always be burnt yeah. to death more slowly. When we looked once, we knew it was lost, so we really weren't looking. We were confirming that it's really lost. <laughs> oh, God. And when he said that, the whole audience, and I'm not crazy. <laughs> it turned into a battle with me where I, I was had to come laughter. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> Part of breaking the awfulizing process by taking yeah. it going out of my mind, I had to prove that, that there wasn't well, an ultrageist in the house that had taken the find it to be <laughs> your, your You know, one yeah. of uh, somebody's craving alcohol. You were on this many, many years ago. Somebody's in a craving. They come in the ring. There's no determination of your relative level of mental health. I'll tell you, Marty. Right, right. you know, uh, yeah. They're distracted. They want to drink. They want to drug. They don't know what to do. They don't think you know. there's anything they can't do. You no, know, I mean they're really 100. percent I know, but I mean when I got stressed up, all of a sudden I was ha- having this really irrational thinking, like I, 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 I have no matter. You know, I don't know what to needing a drink now. I I say to them, okay, imagine. Imagine that you still. And then I was thinking, it's, and it's it's the Twilight Zone, you know. Yeah. He'll divorce me. And everyone <laughs> ends up, I don't want me to do that. You walk out of this office, and you're going to go drink. Where do you go? What is this thing you do? When you take the drink, what does it feel like? What does it taste like? Oh, yeah. Then what makes it happen? Oh, God, everything's gone. <laughs> you know, so this, is, this is kind of the then what happens. Then what happens. Then what happens. Then what happens. And they hit a point going where, and the, you know, the alcohol in their mind creates some kind of release or whatever. Albert Ellis created a word for this, which is called awfulizing. But I don't. Yes. Stop or say, then what happens? Awful. What do you mean? Because that's usually where we stop. Well, then what happens? Then well, then I mean, you just stop in your own mind to make something. Awful. Okay, awful means it's worse than happened. Well, I guess then I think about how it was. it was. Well, then what happened? Well, then I guess I want to do it again. Well, then what happened? Worse than it ever could be. Right. Which is totally yeah. irrational because it is what it is. It's not worse right. than it is. Well, I know I can't do it again. Well, look. What happens? I mean, I lost myself miserable again. Well, then what happens? I get so miserable that I feel I'm justified in that drinking. Well, then what happens? I think another that's irrational. That stress you level know? brings the irrational and, thinking to the foreground, right? Yeah, <laughs> and it's right. So you look every place, yeah. you know, and then what happens? And I have found that no alcohol yeah. addict can take the scenario of your life going to look in those places again because you developed a blind spot. You're not going to see it. So you need a better solution. There are addictive substances. Yeah. In time. And having any concept every person I've ever, that they will not keep going. It's worked with. There was a chronic relapser. And that's, I don't even want to imagine how many people not even like this. Every single one of them at the beginning of our neurology of our fantasies. 
And right. once working a relapse prevents, you have a plan, have the belief that they know causes them to relapse. Uh-huh. And I've never met anyone who had it right. Yeah. Because they come in and you know all these mistakes all in the core of your being that there is a better way then the desire to drink goes away. Yeah. And once you realize, believe, I relapse because I don't go to meetings. I start drinking and drugging because I stop going to meetings. Well, I've known people who have started drinking that no matter what you drink, what you do, what drug you use, and kept going to meetings. Yeah, right. What about them? They never stop. How about them? Yeah. No. I thought it's going to come out badly for you. No matter what you do, you can't control it. It's going to spiral apps because I don't turn it over to God. Well, if anyone can ever describe to me how you turn something over to control and you're going to end up worse, well, that knowledge takes away God. Then I'll say you don't do it. But that is, you know, that's really not helpful, at least mindfulness without meditation, which is not taking away the pain, but it takes away any desire to drink, and it creates a motivation, a form of relaxation that comes out of a Buddhist tradition. It's, 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 re, it's just relaxation, you know? Once yeah. you have yeah. a relaxation, figure out another way to deal with it. So you mentioned yeah. something that technique, a meditation technique. Once you learn some procedure that the that was very interesting to me. And if I think of the worst possible scenario, why would I? You know, would it cause me? Escalates your brain. It has that has the power to interrupt these awfulizing or these depressive thoughts drink and the first time exposed to a program i was sober about nine months and then my whatever the self-defeating stuff is some people upset themselves and make themselves angry some people depress themselves uh, and and make themselves and miserable and i made us pick through and the point is that which i those things when i think they're major some people blame others some people blame themselves you know, but whatever it is, you get locked into it, and you keep. And I'm going to collapse life by running. I make it through, but I've relapsed when life gets good and calm over stupid things. Thoughts through your mind that proves you're not crazy. If I think I'm a bad person, well, this is proof I lost my wedding ring. Well, if I think somebody else is a bad over stupid things. If it made you get drunk, it wasn't stupid. <laughs> that person, you know that your husband moved it. You know, it's his fault. <laughs> so he put something on top of it. Or the okay. <laughs> yeah. The damn wording was made the wrong size. I mean, if it just couldn't cause you to drink, it wasn't stupid. The yeah. thought that it's stupid is, oh, anybody, because they'd be upset or whatever it is. You see? Um, <laughs> So No, it was me. Yeah, when I did it, I thought, oh, my God. Covering up a whole bunch of stuff. Gosh, how could I have forgotten to live up to taking the drink? And you're dismissing it by saying, well, that was stupid. You know, the things I've heard is, you know, I get drunk. I always put it in the same place every night. And I was like, how could I? I let down my guard. This is what actually I. So they don't go to meetings. I get drunk because I was thinking. I thought, oh, as my stress level is too good. I've never known anyone who nearly died of an addiction and then get drunk because they were feeling good. I never know, never met a single person. Accelerated, you know, because I was like, I let down my guard for just one minute and I messed up. If I had to do that. I know. And panicked. <laughs> and a lot of you know, people started no. drinking because they mistakenly believed it would make them feel better. Or, so ridiculous. Me, and I was, just, I was laughing at myself. I was actually laughing stop, at myself for thinking that. Can I just stop you for one takeaway pain? Or, But I've never a minute and go back and you've seen 
Too much happiness caused somebody to drink. I've seen people go into drinking situations. There you are. You're all upset. Yeah. Okay? Did you think about drinking? No. That they used to have fun at, feel out of place. Oh, not at all. I just kept thinking about how much the wedding might cost. Look at all the other people (laughs) not have the capacity to see the truth. These are drunk (laughs) fools and idiots. Please (laughs) just stick with me. Please just stick with me, okay? You didn't think about drinking. Can you go back when you were at and anybody who could enjoy being here actively into your addiction? have their brain sloshed. And, yeah. you know, they, they don't they they say it again. for that. When you were in your active addiction, yeah. would that have caused you to do that? And instead they said to say, well, I want to belong. I want to have a good time. And, you know, and that all of that stuff, many people believe they have a drink. Boy, yeah, I, I would think so. Yeah, I probably would have okay. gone out and gotten loaded. Yeah. So you've done something, drink, for example, for the taste, where you upset yourself and you start psyching. 80% of all alcoholics in surveys do not like the taste of what they drink. Yeah, I they never drink. drink to get in this awful idea, that upsetting mode of thinking that, before, the only way... Yeah, Very I true. drank to get wasted. To, to that, you know, psychologically, <laughs> see, they always have to make up big terms that nobody has in so much pain. Emotional pain. I mean, just, yeah. If it tasted good, they were giving me the wrong thing. <laughs> understand. This out-of-control thinking, they call it ruminating. Yeah. Ruminations. And what we <laughs> sure shows is that when you're... Yeah, right. Uh, but, Gary, do you think... I mean, we can, though, in recovery, we can express... And I could just simply call it stress cycling because you are stress cycling. You're cycling your stress by how you're thinking. Expect to, to be able to gain some skills, right? Which is aggravating your already... Oh, of course. Skills at stress management, skills at stress sensitive brain. And <laughs> then as you get more upset, your thinking shuts down even more. And uh, being able to uh, think more clearly. And I mean, I know that I, you know, I, I uh, well, I'm the one that lost the wedding ring and thought of both. <laughs> you can't acknowledge that you're crazy. Because no, you have- I took it okay at, at, at the height of my stress, but, but you know that's me here. But when, to prove you're not crazy, that the ring really is lost, so you're driven. You know, I lose my house. Uh, but those are just. But I mean, I have times where when I I uh, I take life with a lot of keys, or when I lose my glasses and there's nobody else around. Nobody else has been around. I better. Uh, I've, I've got a lot. I've, I've gained, and I expect to gain more skill. In well, at that point, point, I either have to keep looking and prove it's lost, uh, uh, and and that's that's something that I believe that I I will be able to do uh, if I just keep. keep or I have to acknowledge I'm crazy, or else <laughs> I have to just acknowledge. That we're working on it and and getting to know more and more about the disease and and the uh, the things that happen. Uh, the repeat mistakes. The brain. <laughs> and I'm into a failure. <laughs> and the habit of looking where my glasses are not. And the things that I can expect to have happen in the healing of my brain. And um, uh, I mean, we have to prove that they're lost. <laughs> and even knowing that, I often can't break the mindset that's blocked. That's in recovery, am I right? If we stay with, exactly. stay with absence, well, stay you with see, recovery. Some of, the, some of the most important things about the hangout, and when the, the keys or the glasses or the whatever are found, the relapse people just totally ignore. One of them For is instance, eating, eating nourishing meals, high protein. Yeah. They are normally in plain view, eight inches from someplace I lean, 10 or 12, complex carbohydrates, hydrating, drinking enough water, avoiding excessive caffeine, 
you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. Hey, you you're know, talking about you're talking about plants and things on a on a physical biological level. Um, you know, I I see that the brain, the mindset that. Uh, do you think that uh, well, I mean. Uh, in gathers in recovery units by doing the right stuff. That's you know, the more, every time it. I do the next right thing, every time I eat, the, those of us that are in recovery, right, and we're coming back from the the damage that we've sustained from our on schedule. Every, every time I don't overdose on ice cream. Every time I avoid a caffeinated drink in favor of water. Every time or drugging or both. Um, and we have, I mean, I'm in long-term recovery. I've got 18 I do some thing here. Uh, in, in re- I'm seeing that every plus clicker go off in my brain. And the more recovery points I have stored, the more re- and, uh, I But I still, I know that if I if I engage in uh, negative cash in the bank, you know, so I may lose if I got if I got a hundred thousand dollars in the bank and I lose, okay. and it, you know if, if I engage in in, uh-huh. in ruminations like <laughs> that, I create it ain't a big deal, right? If I've only got ten bucks in the bank and I've got a hundred bucks that needs to last me two weeks and I lose it, it comes back pretty quickly, doesn't it? I mean, the the cycle, the stress cycle, that's a big deal. And and all the other stuff. I mean, it, it comes back to your ears. You see? Yeah, so I like that. Yeah, it is like a thing. off recovery points or recovery dollars, you know, whatever. Yeah, I want it quickly. And then then I I had a mindset when I was in my active addiction. I well, Because of technology works, so these things happen to me. And we have a reserve. But addicts coming from dysfunctional families usually are not very good at planning ahead. And uh, and I kept trying to use to take away the pain, and of course that created more pain. But you are good at doing me. I had this idea that yeah, the two things the two things they don't do, and and this is you know and uh, you know but the other thing uh, that things were bad and that I was no good and that bad things were going to happen. Well, in recovery, yeah, I've changed. You don't have to deal with life perfectly to stay sober. I worked myself to I worked myself into intensive care units three times over my forty plus year it's my attitude but and so that I, I expect good things to happen. The real of spreading the word about relapse. I expect prevention. Good things to happen. I have had a lot because I had the mistaken belief that if I'm helping somebody it's okay to work 70 or 80 hours when things happen. I'm getting You see, better. but if you came into therapy with me, Marty, a week, I'd break you of, um, I, I break you of this, especially when I learned to meditate because then I could reduce my normal sleep pattern from six hours to four, and I'd just keep you pessimistic all the time, see? <laughs> <laughs> because that way I can keep you in therapy. And then if I force myself to get up an hour early if you're in job, that brought up forever. You know, it makes my a lot life. of money. Right. So now I could cut it down to three. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> now, do you see how? Yeah, but you know what? I, I was going to say um, it's, uh, but but if I entertain negative. You know, and some people say this is addictive, but a lot of these thoughts. It's amazing how quickly on the addicts do this, you see. Yes. And I never got drunk over this. Right. The old attitude comes back. Like, oh, man, they're, the world, I you see. Uh, because I knew you couldn't safely drink. Yeah. I got to do this. They're all against me. You know, that option would do nothing. Right. Now, what will come back and I damage me is having this dog on, and I can observe it, you know, and I can correct. I'm never going to use any mood altering. Mind. Get back on mm-hmm. to a more uh, normal. You but can it, but it, mood altering addictive drug, and I develop Lorenz. It, it comes quickly. Please. Spasms. 
which is I am just that's kind of like a thing we have to just keep doing every day. And I had an infection in my throat, and I started strangling to death uh, until I passed out. The- it's because you've got your brain muscles were relaxed, and this was going on over and over again. They took these got two strikes against the emergency room, and I couldn't talk. And I was awake, and the doctor says, already, without considering the brain dysfunction. Now, let me, let me get him a shot of Valium. Explain this. Most, not all, but most. Now, in those days, way back when, I was curving out. Oh, no, I people, no, 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 I become addicted. Come full and the and the and the, the dysfunctional, abusive, or emotional, or emotionally neglectful. Just leaned over and says, "Why are you allergic?" And I signaled for a sheet of paper, and I wrote, "I'm alcoholic." Right. So like, and I showed it to them. The result, they don't get fully enculturated. Dumbest thing I ever did. Because as soon as they read, I'm an alcoholic, which is why they see the world so differently, and they everybody looked at each other, took a step back, um, developed ways to cope with from the table, and walked out of the treatment room, leaving the pain, me alone strangling while they debated what um, they had to do. Oh, my. Do work and keep their sanity for gosh. And then... I refuse to take any muscle relaxants at that moment when they're kids, but they they become. And I end up embedded in your first personality, intensive care unit, on the verge of dying because I was strangled, which is the most powerful and never fully goes away. And it, it so all of these uh-huh. like organ problems and the beliefs, and I believe all this is damaging my brain as I was doing this stuff. But I wouldn't take value. And finally, they they got they found a recovering psychiatrist. You can um, work around them when you came in, and he found some offbeat muscle relaxant that I didn't know were in a low stress state. Yes. But when you're about high, says. Do you strong all state this? And I said, no. He said, good, take it. And when I took the yeah. muscle relaxant, with it, you go back, these are called survival responses. And they really, oh, yeah. in 20 minutes, I stopped to save your life when you were right. younger. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then I fell asleep. Right. Okay. Now, yeah. the whole thing is adult though, trauma. I had adult trauma, and I had PTSD, and I think sometimes that comes back. Uh, now, is that the same thing as the early childhood stuff, or is it a different well, set the of... Thing uh, is, and this is an important thing, and this is something I don't know if you want to introduce somebody too early in their recovery. The relapse doesn't live in the drug. When you, when you have childhood trauma, which almost mm-hmm. everybody it doesn't live in the bottle. It doesn't live in right. the hypodermic needle. It's cognitive, isn't it? Well, uh, to some degree. And yeah. then when you experience adult trauma, which almost is a biopsychosocial, my reaction yeah. to the drug is going to be different. Everybody does at some point. Yeah. Um, if you haven't developed a tool, thing, because when – now – and also, this thing, a drug is a drug is a drug. Well, it's to manage this. What the current trauma does is it hooks you back and it's comfortable, but it's not true. It's not true. I was a neck into very vivid memories of the unresolved childhood trauma addicted to alcohol. I tried marijuana three times and hated it each time I tried it. There is a drug. Those who get all mixed up and double charge your already stress-sensitive brain. Of choice in a small population of addicts are what are often called garbage heads. They'll do anything, but not everything uh-huh. is. And then if you don't know what's going on, you have no way to begin on tank. What leads to the loss of control is I'm miserable and I want to feel better. Uh, so I, 
Because in the moment you're identifying with your thoughts, you're not sitting there. I'll take what in my mind is a non-drug drug. Have you got that? A non-drug yeah. drug. I don't see this as a drug. Yeah. yourself, my prescription valve. You're sitting there into the moment. So, you know, prescription Librium, a prescription painkiller. I take a non-drug drug. If it's not my drug of choice, stop. it doesn't take stop yourself. You don't know how to stop yourself. You've never learned how to do it. Now, yeah. well, you my emotional pain and stress away. So then I'm disappointed. But that ends, you know, I can say, well, you know, okay, I need something else. Thanks. You said that you hit a point where you got so frustrated with it, you started to laugh. But I need something else, and I need something else until I end up going back to my drug of choice. And the drug of choice for a moment works. But there's a story, and it's by a man, it's by a science fiction writer named Heinlein who wrote this phenomenal moment. And then all hell breaks loose yeah. in my brain. You know? So I'm on a new book a million years ago called oh, The Stranger in a He is the poly drug relapse range land. And it's oh, about I love a guy who Yeah, a guy who was raised on that uh, route is normally people, you know, what what's getting them to get started oh. Martian, but he was human and as he comes back to Earth this belief that there is a a uh, better living through chemistry. Martian by culture, and the one thing you can't do that people do is laugh. And I can take a pill, and it will make my life good. Oh. One day he goes to the I just can take, and he sees the pill, and it will improve my marriage. Do you realize how oh. great a uh, big monkey? Um, uh, he sees the um, Erectile dysfunction went up 10,000% since Viagra. It was the second biggest month on the market in the pecking order. Get a peanut, and the big one takes it away from Wow. I didn't realize that. Oh, him. And he goes to hit yeah. him, and the big monkey snaps. It's just amazing because ED is now a thing of football players. So when he goes to hit the big monkey back and realize he's going to be toast, so he goes down to the next. And I'm treating my ED, and that's a manly one of the thing to do. And then he puts a king comedy skit on an order and smacks them. Who goes to the next one? And it's Saturday Night Live, and there's a woman sitting in a closet. You can hear the house being torn apart. Smacks them until finally the smallest, weakest monkey. Dance. And oh, hi Gladys! He pulls out his over. Hi Gladys. Gets so on that, goes to hit somebody. There's nobody to hit. Not doing much. No, just hiding in the closet till my husband's Viagra wears off. So he pulls up in a ball on the bottom of the cage. And at this point, Michael Valentine. Now, is it possible you have the Martian starts to laugh? Erectile dysfunction, or the limp D syndrome, as I like to call it. <laughs> and the people with him were trying to teach him about because you're you in it. Laughter is what the limp B. Are you laughing? Oh. And he got it. His response is very instructive. I'm laughing. That's because he's a man or a woman. Okay. Because, but you hurt so much. You can't get an erection when you're with somebody. Nothing else I can do with it. Oh, boy. That's a really good illustration. Emotionally connected to. <laughs> Bingo. Or it's not a, you want to have good sex, build a relationship. It's about good times. Humor no. is time. Viagra will make you feel physiologically ready, but it will not. There is uh, projecting my pain onto a vehicle to compensate. Twisting it around and making it. So I have to do a time check here. Um, yeah. Tape so I can laugh at them. We have about five minutes left, and we'll no, or laugh at myself. I mean, I I don't. Have to but I'm, I'm a comedian, so I, I wrap it up. I think this is a, a great topic. <laughs> 
But um, I've, uh, and maybe if I could plant a little seed. Where what I do in stand-up comedy is more self-deprecating humor. So I plan to have a, another show uh, with Dr. Terry Gorski. And yeah, one that's thing, I, more mine. But yeah, I, I know I know what you're talking about. And people, I, I appreciate the doctor degree, but I don't people yeah, remember and, him to extreme and, of one. Oh, okay. I'm not a All doctor. Right. Okay. I can just have it's a master's degree. Gorgeous. But if you can protect me or I have the paperwork too, the degree. Yeah, it mm-hmm. comes from angst that goes along with, you know, laughter. Yeah, does. because I mean, when you're when you're you writing comedy material, you want. But I gracefully accept it, but I, yeah. I don't want to <laughs> people. I'm not a doctor. We'll have to okay. give you an honor write about what your degree from Pure Motive Radio University about or what your <laughs> you want anger is a real good the way to produce comedy. <laughs> That's the uh, form that uh here at, uh yes. I'm a get that. I do have a doctor <laughs> you know. So you need to raise a degree. A friend of mine who worked awareness on something causing at the McDonalds Institute for Training gave me a doctoral degree in hamburgerology when I was playing horrible pain that's part of the human condition and then when it starts to get <laughs> almost unbearable you provide the comic <laughs> oh terry it's been wonderful having you on the show by flipping the script you're absolutely and making it funny brilliant and this has been so fascinating just to talk about the kind of things that we people in recovery yeah, I think we all do that day to day. I mean, I think we do that day to day. Need to hear, and if we want to be emotionally resilient, we, uh, it's very valuable. And uh, well, you know, I, I know we you. have another and show coming up. We have to be able to not take ourselves too seriously. And I just, I just don't. And, and mm-hmm. we all know that works in recovery. Anytime I start thinking that I take too much ownership of the ideas because they can't tell you where they all came. But you know, I am just I'm just somebody I've gotta think I've gotta take myself seriously. I'm in trouble. Because I'm really who kind of puts ideas of other people together, make them fit and, and figure out how to talk about them and write about them. But I'm no fun when I'm when I'm doing that. None of yes. this stuff is truly original. It's all part of understanding the human condition and understanding yeah. how to live in the world drug free. Yeah, sure. Nobody has that. Well, we don't expect everything to be all original. I mean, aren't we kind of sitting on the – when I'm taking myself seriously? I take life seriously. I take my recovery seriously. But taking myself seriously <laughs> for disaster. What about you, Steve? What do you think? I'm on the shoulders of all the other people that have, have accumulated knowledge? I mean, there's – so anyway, that's Absolutely. philosophical, but as, yeah. But as, as somebody yeah. who's alive, the entire history of human evolution and all its horrors and all its beauty lives. Well, I think it's a fascinating conversation, and I know we've talked about it in our brain. And because if it didn't, we'd never be able to pass it on. That's right. So about this before the different roles in the family. And my, I identify. And the trick is learning how to enjoy what is there to enjoy and to, and to enjoy the beautiful and accept the fact that there's also the ugly. To enjoy yes. peace, but be aware yeah. that that sometimes you hide with that because my defense mechanism has been humor. If, I mean, sometimes violence exists, and when it comes to call, sometimes you have to fight that. That's right. The world well, that's is that's great. Not either. Whenever there was a problem, my father was an alcoholic, but whenever there was a problem, just. That's right. No unrealistic expectations. And uh, I, it, this is a wonderful, I think it's a wonderful way to end the show. I think we've got just a couple more minutes. Don't we, Steve? Yeah, or we do. Or are we past our time? We do? No, we we, we have a, just a few people laugh, and then everything will be okay. And I use humor to this day in it. Okay, so, Terry, what I wanted to do is I wanted to mention uh, uh, your website and, uh, you know, how can people, I, people get a hold of you, uh, where can they read your blog, thanks. and uh, and your, have five uh, you, your many books. The, de- so, uh, the defense mechanism. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Humor. 
Well, um, think of relapse and then put a dot .org at the end of it, and that's where all my books and publications are. And okay. there's a universal defense mechanism. Relapse.org. Relapse.org, www.relapse.org. All of my books are there. Uh, the album, you can that life hurts. Also, just Google my name or Google the title of a book, and, um, you know, I didn't just, and we're, none of us are getting out of it alive. <laughs> you know, right. honest Hemingway, all true stories are getting out of it alive. He was anything, but I get I get like over 150,000 hits when I put my name in it. Um, but you will find you can find you know just put Terry Gorski face. You know yeah. we don't get out of it alive, and we yeah. don't get you know think about this. People let, look Terry Gorski blog. Ter, you know just put my name Terry or Terrence Gorski, and there are many other oh. Gorskis who are very successful. That's when I talk about relationships. But think about the absolutely best ending of a long term but I'm the one I'm the only one in the addiction field. So Terry, let's spell Gorski for everybody. It's G O R S committed married couple. What's the absolute best ending that can come to in the long run of their life? A I, right? Correct. Okay, so everybody gets that that right. G O R S K I uh they can both yeah. they die, die yeah. in bed, in their sleep on the same night. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And how long? Well, Terry Gorski, a um, friend of mine on Facebook. Uh, you're on Twitter, Terry? I do Twitter, but I can't say anything unless. When does that happen? Virtually no. never. It's statistically no. insignificant. Normally, one of those. Oh, 150 characters, whatever it is, so it frustrates yeah. me, so I avoid it. Uh, I post and on Twitter, but I don't. I can't respond to anything because fools dies and abandons the other one, and the one who dies first gets the better of the deal. Yeah. <laughs> Just them incapable no. of being concise. No problem. So, and it's T E R R Y, the first name T E R R Y. Right. So T E R R Y T O R S. The one that goes out first gets the gets the best deal. C E one R in Terrence with an E, but there's a story behind that. There's not time to tell it. Okay, well we'll be having you on again. <laughs> you see, but did you yeah. notice how they twisted it? Because most people yeah. say, "Oh, it's a terrible." Um, for another show, so you can tell that story when we're lucky enough to have you back. And thank you so much, Terry. He died for being with us today. It's truly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you did hear about the the 82 year old man who went to his honor to have you here on on uh, kick ass personal transformation with Marty McGibbon and Steve Thompson. Thank you, Steve. Through the get a physical because he was getting married, and the doctor the doctor says to him, he says he says, oh that's good, you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> Hello, friends. This is Steve the Sherry. Thompson, executive producer of Pure Final Years with. You have a picture, and he pulls out a picture, and it's a 22 year old Playboy bunny. You know, one of these sex bombs. Motive Radio. We hope you've enjoyed the kick ass personal transformation show with Marty McGibbon. And tune in next week, Monday at 7. Hi, women. And the doctor yeah. looks at him, looks at the pictures, and says, This is going to be your wife? He says, Oh, yes. And he says, Stanley, I've been your doctor for over 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where Marty will have more of this entertaining, inspirational, motivational program broadcast to you. I tell you, the heart can only stand so much. The veins can only stand so much. The arteries can only stand so much. Kick-Ass Personal Transformation is brought to you by the Pure Motive Radio Network. Hey, check out our website. Simply go to www. Can reduce, and I'm telling you, I recommend against this because your wedding night could end in death. www.puremotiveinc.com. Again, that's puremotiveinc.com. We're also on Facebook. Simply look for shock. He thinks about it. He says, well, you know, doctor, Live the long life. 
I've loved and I've lost. I've been married four times. I've- Your Motive Radio. And like us because we like you. If you've enjoyed succeeded in this show, you'll probably like all of the other shows we have. Tune in. And I guess I just have to take it with a grain of salt. If she dies, she dies. <laughs> <laughs> On Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the One Upper Show, where callers call in with their best stories to one up each other. <laughs> Then on Wednesdays, we have the Serenity Sisters show. They cover all the issues women face in sobriety. This twist is humorous. Put on your big girl panties. Tune in with the Serenity Sisters. And Catharsis has been so contaminated. A night at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Simply the ability to have an emotional release. It means being able for a moment. This ruminating, self abusing, or other abusing. <laughs> Highly stressful automatic thinking process. One of the things we. have to learn how to stop. Because if we don't. and the stress gets high enough, we won't be able to stop it unless circumstances or people outside of us intervene. And then if we can't turn it off, we start to hurt so much we can't stand it, but we can't laugh anymore. And there's only one thing that always works. The addictive brain goes on and says, you know, this is my ultimate survival mechanism. Why not? I'll just get the relief and then I'll stop. Or I know this is the beginning of the end, but what the hell? If this is sobriety, who wants it? Mm-hmm. Right. Now, and when so somebody there's, always has... a, there's always a relapse justification <clears throat> right? that people have. And that is the last, I think, the last vestige in recovery that people have to come to terms with. If you really get people to really think deeply, what would have to happen to you? What would you have to lose that would hurt you bad enough that it would justify drinking? And there's usually something for people in early recovery. For people who have really got the truth, you know, my day in the sun with my addiction is over. My brain Mm -hmm. is adapted, and it just won't ever work again. Right. You know, I found myself wishing I could drink and make it go away, but I know it won't work. No, I I know know that, that too. If somebody came into my house and put a gun to my head and said, uh, uh, drink or I'll shoot, I'd just say, go ahead and kill me because I'm not not doing it. It would be the same thing. They might as well just put a bullet through my head because because I can't. I'm a little different. I'd say... I would say, give me the bottle. I'd pretend to drink and then smash them in the head with it. <laughs> you well, know? that's a better because strategy. Because if I go down, I'm taking a piece of somebody with me. That's just me, however. <laughs> All um, right, I modified, my, I modified my plan, and I'm going to go with your role model. I'll, I'll do the I same thing. I'll ask for the bottle, and I'll whack them. I, act, I actually wrote down, I posted it on my Facebook page, your quote. I do mindfulness to manage the stress from fighting back against the many forces trying to control me. Yep. And I gave you credit. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I used a little bit of profanity, and you you washed it for me. That that was really good. Thank you for making it. Yeah. I I don't ever look any blank and swear, you know. 
Um, yes. Um, no, I was it, but you know these, you know, uh, there's there was there was one person who used to tell me when my brain gets out of control, I have two choices: I can laugh or I can wane philosophical. And what he meant by that is he can begin reflecting on his philosophy of life and begin realizing that there's nothing awful because it can't be worse than it really is. It is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah. You know? And, so yeah. You, and you, you meant- if it is what it is, it's not worse than it is. And it could always be worse. I listened to Albert Ellis. It was a privilege to have heard him lecture on a number of occasions. And one time in a question and answer, he says, you have to always be capable of reminding yourself that things can always get worse than they are. And one person raised his head, so I disagree with you, Dr. Ellis. If you're being burned to death, how can it possibly get worse? And without even pausing, Ellis said, you could always be burnt to death more slowly. (laughs) And when he said that, the whole audience burst out in laughter. Yes. Part of of breaking the awfulizing process by taking it to the absurd. You know, one of uh, somebody's craving alcohol. I learned this many, many years ago. Somebody's in a craving. They come into my office. They're distracted. They want to drink. They want to drug. They don't know what to do. They don't believe there's anything they can do. You know, I mean, they're really 100% into needing a drink now. I, I say to them, okay, imagine. Imagine that you stand up. I don't want you to do it. You walk out of this office, and you're going to go drink. Where do you go? What do you do? When you take the drink, what does it feel like? What does it taste like? Then what happens? Then what happens? Then what happens? Then what happens? And they hit a point where, you know, the alcohol in their mind creates some kind of release or whatever. But I don't stop there. I say, then what happens? What do you mean? Because that's usually where we stop. Well, then what happens? Well, then I just stop. Okay, then what happens? Well, I guess then I think about how good it was. Well, then what happens? Well, then I guess I want to do it again. Well, then what happens? Well, I know I can't do it again. Well, then what happens? I make myself miserable again. Well, then what happens? I get so miserable that I feel unjustified in drinking. Well, then what happens? I take another drink. And then what happens? And I have found that no alcoholic or addict can take the scenario of using their addictive substance one time and having any concept that they will not keep going. It's not even in our neurology of our fantasies. And right. once you have and you know in the core of your being that there is a better way, then the desire to drink goes away. Yeah. And once you realize that no matter <clears throat> what you drink, what you do, what you use, that it's going to come out badly for you, No matter what you do, you can't control it. It's going to spiral out of control, and you're going to end up worse. Well, that knowledge takes away, it doesn't take away the pain, but it takes away any desire to drink, and it creates a motivation to figure out another way to deal with it. So you mentioned something that, that was very interesting to me, and if I think of the worst possible scenario, why would I, you know, would it cause me to drink? And the first time exposed to a program, I was sober about nine months, and then my father died, and I made it through. And the point is that which I, those things, when I think they're major and I'm going to collapse, I make it through, but I've relapsed when life gets good and calm over stupid things? Well, over stupid things. If it made you get drunk, it wasn't stupid. (laughs) Okay? (laughs) That's the first thing. If it caused you to drink, it wasn't stupid. The thought that it's stupid is covering up a whole bunch of stuff that led up to taking the drink. And you're dismissing it by saying, well, that was stupid. 
you know, the things I've heard is, you know, I get drunk because I don't go to meetings. I get drunk because I was feeling too good. I've never known anyone who nearly died of an addiction and then get drunk because they were feeling good. I never, know, never met a single person who did that. I met a lot of people who started drinking because they mistakenly believed it would make them feel better or it would take away pain. Or, But I've never seen... Too much happiness caused somebody to drink. I've seen people go into drinking situations that they used to have fun at, feel out of place, look at all the other people, not have the capacity to see the truth. These are drunken fools and idiots. And yeah. anybody who could enjoy being here has to have their brain sloshed. And, yeah. you know, they they don't see that, and instead they say, well... I want to belong, I want to have a good time, and, you know, and that all of that stuff, many people believe they drink, for example, for the taste. 80% of all alcoholics in surveys do not like the taste of what they drink. Yeah, I they never drink to get the effect. Yeah, Very I drank true. to get wasted to, 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 because I was in so much pain, emotional pain. I mean, just, yeah. If it tasted good, they were giving me the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but, Gary, do you think, I mean, we can, though, in recovery, we can expect to to be able to gain some skills, right? Oh, of course. Skills in stress management, skills in uh, being able to uh, think more clearly. And, I mean, I know that I, you know, I, I uh, well, I'm the one that lost a wedding ring and, Thought of poltergeist took it okay at, at, at the height of my stress, but but you know that's me here. But when, when uh, but those are just. But I mean, I have times where when I I uh, I take life with a lot better. Uh, I've, I've got a lot. I've, I've gained, and I expect to gain more skill in recovery. Uh, and and that's that's something that I believe that I I will be able to do uh, if I just keep keep working on it and and getting to know more and more about the disease and and the uh, the things that happen to the brain and, and the things that I can expect to have happen in the healing of my brain and um, uh, I mean we can expect to have this in recovery am I right if we stay with exactly. stay with well, stay you with see, recovery. Some of them- some of the most important things that lead to relapse, people just totally ignore. One of them For is instance, eating, eating nourishing meals, high protein, yes. complex carbohydrates, hydrating, drinking enough water, yeah. avoiding excessive caffeine. You know, these types of things on a, on a physical, biological level, um, you know, I, I see that the brain gathers recovery units by doing the right stuff. That's you know, the more, every time it. I do the next right thing, every time I eat my meals on schedule, every time I don't overdose on ice cream, every time I avoid a caffeinated drink in favor of water, every time I do something right, I'm seeing that plus clicker go off in my brain. And the more recovery points I have stored, the more resilient I'm going to be because That's I have a lot right. of cash in the bank. You know, so I may lose, if I got, if I got $100,000 in the bank and I lose 100 bucks, it ain't a big deal. Right. If I've only got 10 bucks in the bank and I've got 100 bucks that needs to last me two weeks and I lose it, that's a big deal. It is. You see? Yeah, so I like that. Yeah, it is like a thing. You off recovery points or recovery dollars, you know, whatever mm-hmm. whatever analogy works, so that yeah. we have a reserve. But addicts coming from dysfunctional families usually are not very good at planning ahead, nor are they good at doing maintenance. Yeah. The two things, the two things they don't do. And, and this is, you know, and, you know, but the other thing is, you don't have to deal with life perfectly to stay sober. I worked myself to I worked myself into intensive care units three times over my forty plus year career of spreading the word about relapse prevention. Hmm. Because I had the mistaken belief that if I'm helping somebody, it's okay to work seventy or eighty hours a week, especially when I learned to meditate because then I could reduce my normal sleep pattern from six hours to four 
And then if I forced myself to get up an hour earlier and jog, that brought oxygen to my brain. So now I could cut it down to three. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> now, do you see how, you know, and some people will say this is addictive, but a lot of non-addicts do this, you see. Yes. And I never got drunk over this. Right. You see? Uh, because I knew I couldn't safely drink. That option would do nothing. Right. Now, what's damaged me is having this doggone, I'm never going to use any mood-altering, mind-altering, addictive drug. And I developed laryngospasms, which is I have bad infection in my throat, and I started strangling to death until I passed out, then the muscles were relaxed. And this was going on over and over again. They took me to the emergency room, and I couldn't talk. And I was awake, and the doctor says, get him a shot of Valium. Now, in those days, way back when, I was curving alcohol. No, I said, no, 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 no. And, the, and, the, and the, the nurse leaned over and says, why, are you allergic? And I signaled for a sheet of paper, and I wrote, I'm alcoholic, and I showed it to him. Dumbest thing I ever did, because as soon as they read, I'm an alcoholic, everybody looked at each other, took a step back from the table, and walked out of the treatment room, leaving me alone strangling while they debated what to do. Oh, my gosh. And then I refused to take any muscle relaxants, and I ended up in an intensive care unit on the verge of dying because I was strangling. And it, it probably I was damaging my brain as I was doing this, but I wouldn't take value. And finally they, they, got, they found a recovering psychiatrist who came in, and he found some offbeat muscle relaxant that I didn't know about. And he says, do you know of this? And I said, no. He said, good, take it. And when I took the yeah. muscle relaxant, within 20 minutes, I stopped strangling. Yeah. And yeah. then I fell asleep. Now, yeah. the whole thing is, and this is an important thing, and this is something I don't know if you want to introduce somebody too early in their recovery, the relapse doesn't live in the drug. It doesn't live in the bottle. It doesn't live right. in the hypodermic needle. It's cognitive, isn't it? Well, it's a biopsychosocial. My reaction yeah. to the drug is going to be different, you see, because when now, and also this thing, a drug is a drug is a drug. It's nice and it's comfortable, but it's not true. It's not true. I was addicted to alcohol. I tried marijuana three times and hated it each time I tried it. There is a drug of choice in a small population of addicts or what are often called garbage heads. They'll do anything, but not everything is going to work. What leads to the loss of control is I'm miserable and I want to feel better, so I take what in my mind is a non-drug drug. Have you got that? A non-drug yeah. drug. I don't see this as a drug. My prescription Valium, prescription Librium, a prescription painkiller. I take a non-drug drug. If it's not my drug of choice, it doesn't take my emotional pain and stress away. So then I'm disappointed. But now I can say, well, okay, I need something else, and I need something else, and I need something else until I end up going back to my drug of choice. And the drug of choice for a moment works, but just a moment. And then all hell breaks loose yeah. in my brain, you know? So the whole thing is the poly drug relapse route is normally people, you know, what, what's getting them to get started is this belief that there is a better living through chemistry. I can take a pill, and it will make my life good. I can take a pill, and it will improve my marriage. Do you realize the rate of um, erectile dysfunction went up 10,000% since Viagra was put on the market? Wow. I didn't realize that. 
Oh, yeah. It's just amazing because ED is now a thing of football players, and I'm treating my ED, and that's a manly thing to do. And then they did a comedy skit on it on Saturday Night Live, and there's a woman sitting in a closet. You can hear the house being torn apart. And, oh, hi, Gladys. The pros are open. Hi, Gladys. Oh, I'm not doing much. No, just hiding in the closet till my husband's Viagra wears off. <laughs> <laughs> now, is it possible you have erectile dysfunction or the limp D syndrome, as I like to call it? Because what you're in it, the limp D. Oh. <laughs> he got it. Too good. That's because he's a man or a woman. Okay. <laughs> but you you can't get an erection when you're with somebody you're not emotionally connected to. Bingo. You want to have good sex, build a relationship. Viagra will make you physiologically ready, but it will not emotionally compensate. So I have to do a time check here. Um, we have about five minutes left, and we'll have to wrap it up. I think this is a, a great topic, <laughs> but um, maybe if I could plant a little seed, we're going to have a, another show uh, with Dr. Terry Gorski. And, and one thing I, that I, I appreciate the doctor degree, but I don't have one. Oh, okay. I'm not a All doctor. Right. Okay. I just have it's a master's degree. Gorgeous. But if you can provide the paperwork and the degree that goes along with that, I gratefully accept it. But I, yeah. I don't want to <laughs> people. I'm not a doctor. We'll have to okay. give you an honorary degree from Pure Motive Radio University as soon as we uh, form that. Uh, that uh, yes, I miss that. that. <laughs> I do have a doctoral degree. A friend of mine who worked at the McDonald's. Institute for Training gave me a doctoral degree in hamburgerology when I was 26. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Terry, it's been wonderful having you on the show. Uh, you're absolutely brilliant, and this has been so fascinating just to talk about the kind of things that we people in recovery need to hear, and uh, it's very valuable. And well, uh, you know, I, I know we you. have another and, show coming up. And I just I just don't take too much ownership of the ideas because I can't tell you where they all came, but you know I am just I'm just somebody who kind of puts ideas of other people together, make them fit, and and figure out how to talk about them and write about them. But none of yeah. this stuff is truly original. It's all part of understanding the human condition and understanding yeah. how to live in the world drug free. Yeah, sure. Nobody has that. Well, we don't expect everything to be all original. I mean, aren't we kind of sitting on the on the on the shoulders of all the other people that have, have accumulated knowledge? I mean, there's so anyway. That's Absolutely philosophical, but as, yeah. But as, as somebody yeah. who's alive, the entire history of human evolution and all its horrors and all its beauty lives within our brain. And because if it didn't, we'd never be able to pass it on. That's right. So, and the trick is learning how to enjoy what is there to enjoy and to, and to enjoy the beautiful and accept the fact that there's also the ugly. To enjoy yes. peace, but be aware yeah. that that sometimes you need, sometimes violence exists and when it comes to call, sometimes you have to fight that. That's right. The world well, that's is hope, great. not either or. That's right. No unrealistic expectations. And uh, I, it, this is a wonderful, I think it's a wonderful way to end the show. I think we've got just a couple more minutes, don't we, Steve? Yeah, or we do. Or we passed our time. We do? No, we, we, we have a, just a few more minutes. Okay, so, Terry, what I wanted to do is I wanted to mention uh, uh, your website and, uh, you know, how can people get a hold of you, uh, where can they read your blog, and uh, and you have find your many books. So, well, um, think of relapse and then put a dot org at the end of it, and that's where all my books and publications are. And okay. relapse dot org. Um, relapse dot org. www dot relapse dot org. All of my books are there. Um, you can also just Google my name or Google the title of a book and. Um, you know, I didn't think it was anything, but I get I get like over 150,000 hits when I put my name in it. 
Um, but you will find, you can find, you know, just put Terry Gorski Facebook, Terry Gorski blog, Terry, you know, just put my name, Terry or Terrence Gorski. And there are many other oh. Gorskis who are very successful, but I'm the one, I'm the only one in the addiction field. So, Terry, let's spell Gorski for everybody. It's G-O-R-S-K-I, right? Correct. Okay, so everybody gets that, that right. G-O-R-S-K-I. Uh, Google Terry Gorski, um, friend him on Facebook. Uh, you're on Twitter, Terry? I do Twitter, but I can't say anything in less than uh, 150 characters or whatever it is, so it frustrates yeah. me, so I avoid it. Uh, I post and on Twitter, ca- but I don't. I can't respond to anything because I just am incapable nope. of being concise. No problem. So, and it's T E R R Y, the first name T E R R Y. So T E R Y T O R S E N C E. One R in Terrence with an E, but there's a story behind that. There's not time to tell it. Okay. Well, we'll be having you on again for another show, so you can tell that story when we're lucky enough to have you back. And thank you so much, Terry, for being with us today. It's truly an honor to have you here on on uh, Kick-Ass Personal Transformation with Marty McGibbon and Steve Thompson. Thank you, Steve. Hello, friends. This is Steve Thompson, executive producer at Pure Motive Radio. We hope you've enjoyed the Kick-Ass Personal Transformation show with Marty McGibbon. And tune in next week, Monday at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where Marty will have more of this entertaining, inspirational, motivational program broadcast to you. Kick-Ass Personal Transformation is brought to you by the Pure Motive Radio Network. Hey, check out our website. Simply go to www.puremotiveinc.com. Again, that's puremotiveinc.com. We're also on Facebook. Simply look for Pure Motive Radio and like us because we like you. If you've enjoyed this show, you'll probably like all of the other shows we have. Tune in on Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the One Upper Show, where callers call in with their best stories to one-up each other. Then on Wednesdays, we have the Serenity Sisters Show. They cover all the issues women face in sobriety. It's time to put on your big girl panties. Tune in with the Serenity Sisters Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. <laughs>